Welcome to the regular briefing session of the Forsyth County Board of Commissioners. For those just joining us on television, we've just completed a very good uh, business meeting where we voted and uh, helped, I think, the community in many different ways that uh, really needed it and wanted it, and I'm glad we were able to do that. But now we're briefing for the next meeting, and I'll turn that meeting over to Dudley Watts, our county manager. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. and. Um, and good afternoon again. So um, as many know, we're gonna change up the format a little bit. We're gonna have actually staff come in and brief the items uh, for the March 17th meeting next Thursday. Um, I'm gonna real quickly kind of run through and give you an idea of what we are working on towards that end. Um, and then, um, and you, if, obviously if you've got any questions um, uh, or ideas, just go, you know, feel free to share them. We're not trying to cut off conversation there. It's just, the agenda items, if you looked on the agenda right now, they are not live hyperlinks, and they will not be live hyperlinks until we get through probably uh, Tuesday, Wednesday. Next Tuesday afternoon. Next Tuesday afternoon will be our goal. And um, as we started thinking about that, trying to change up of process, the other benefit that we have from that is we don't have staff waiting here through the formal meeting. So when we come in, we can jump right into them. So anyway, real quickly, what we're gonna have for you next week, um, you heard a little bit of it today. Um, there's a resolution authorizing the open display of discharge of firearms at Triad Park under limited circumstances. If I can get um, Damon to come up and talk about that just a little bit, because it is a, uh, it is a, um, a little bit time sensitive. So thank you, Mr. Manager, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Uh, so this uh, item for your consideration in the upcoming meeting uh, will be a Veterans Memorial proposal that you heard a little bit about in the uh, public session to take place at Triad Park at the Carolina Field of Honor. Uh, Triad Park, just as a, as a summary, is, is jointly owned by Forsyth and Guilford Counties. Uh, some of the things in, in local agreement that are relevant to this item are that the uh, County Parks and Recreation Department operates Triad Park on behalf of both Guilford and Forsyth County. Uh, Triad Park is operated under regulations that both counties agree to as the need arises in operating the park from time to time, that's in section five. And then the operation, maintenance, and capital expense of the park are split 50-50 between Forsyth and Guilford County. The park itself opened in uh, October of 1997. And a couple of the images there, one is of um, Woodland Hall and then a uh, uh, volleyball pit there at the park. Uh, the War Memorial Foundation proposed developing the Field of Honor uh, to be located at Triad Park. Both Forsyth and Guilford agreed to that, and it was constructed in uh, 2013. There's the rendering of it, and this is the actual thing there on the right. So the contractual agreement between Forsyth and Guilford and War Memorial Foundation reads that uh, there are a couple of days, Veterans Day and Memorial Day of each year, and then one additional day that would be uh, dedicated for use by the War Memorial Foundation. Uh, and so that one additional day they don't often use, they often just use Veterans Day and Memorial Day. Um, then section four notes that the county reserves the right to charge fees for the use of the field. However, we haven't charged the War Memorial Foundation to uh, use the shelters there uh, that are adjacent to it because they spent so much to actually put the memorial there in, in the first place. 
So we actually have not charged them for that. So uh, as noted below with the asterisk, each year the War Memorial Foundation conducts a program on veterans at Memorial Day. Uh, shelter rental season is April 1st through October 31st. So the request that's uh, before you from the gentleman that spoke earlier is actually the end of March, so it actually is not in shelter rental season. So in any event, we would not have charged them to rent both shelters because we're actually not renting them yet by the time they have their, their event. So in 2017, a Vietnam Veteran War uh, Veterans Recognition Act was signed into law. So it really came into effect in 2017. And then in a 2021 at least, an informal commemoration was held at the Carolina Field of Honor for National Vietnam War Veterans Day. Uh, now that was uh, informally done, so the shelters weren't reserved, but there also wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't 21 gun salute. It wasn't um, uh, reserved specifically for them, so it wasn't just their area. People could still have events there, and so you could still have a conflict of use because it wasn't just for them at that point. So in 2022, they've actually submitted a request to reserve the field of honor and the two shelters that would come with them, although, again, shelter season is not open yet, uh, to conduct a National Vietnam War Veterans Day commemoration to include a 21-gun salute. So the county code uh, at this point notes uh, that no person shall possess openly any pistol or gun in or on any Forsyth County Park or recreational facility that we operate, manage, or control at the county. So it's currently written, the county code would prohibit open carry of any gun and actually also to discharge. I didn't actually include that ordinance here, but there is one where you can't actually discharge a weapon, whether it's blanks or live, within 300, uh, I think, feet or yards of a shelter, basically something that holds people. So that would be a conflict too. However, uh, 347 of the park's 434 acres are in Guilford County, including the field of honor. So the county code doesn't apply. We can't enforce the county code in Guilford County. So Guilford County's code section 135A also prohibits open carry of firearms in any park with some notable exceptions, that when a weapon is used solely for Guilford County sanctioned ceremonial purposes, so if they sanction this event, then, then it could be done under Guilford's current ordinance that prohibits open carry. And then when a weapon is used solely in a Guilford County approved program conducted under the supervision of a person that has been approved by a county authority, that could also apply in this instance. So the resolution under consideration notes uh, for Scythe County's agreement to allow a 21 gun salute at Triad Park under certain circumstances. And those are where open carry and discharge of firearms can take place at Triad Park. Um, so basically that's the only place is Triad Park. When an individual or organization can open carry and discharge firearms at Triad Park is what's gonna also deal with. And then only specially modified weapons that only shoot blanks that somebody else in law enforcement would confirm, because our staff's not comfortable confirming whether that's true or not. Uh, would be the case. So what the, the resolution specifically does, uh, the entrance to the park has to be posted to let people who are using the park that are not part of this ceremony know that this is gonna take place. So if you're on the walking trail, playing volleyball, soccer, or a birthday party, whatever it might be, uh, you're gonna hear shooting that day. But normally they, they hadn't had that experience there. Um, you'd have to rent the shelters if it's an event that took place during our shelter rental period, although this is not during our shelter rental period, the proposed event. Uh, it also notes who may open carry and discharge firearms at Triad Park. And with that, uh, I will take any questions or comments that you might have. Questions, comments? I, I and, do. And, um, could you explain further the law enforcement you're talking about? Sure. So um, to confirm that the weapon that they're using is uh, only shoots blanks and doesn't shoot, not capable of shooting bullets, uh, they get the sheriff's office or somebody in Guilford or Forsyth County to confirm that that's the case. Otherwise, you're leaving it to the park maintenance guy to say that's true or not. So they might be shooting bullets for all we know. We wouldn't know. Well, I, I really think that's kind of insulting to this group. I mean, they all do respect to law enforcement, but they probably know as much about, more about ammunition than they do. Uh, and they do this hundreds of times a year without anybody inspecting their ammunition. Well, so, so maybe for this group, perhaps, but this is going to open it up for other people. It's not just these people. Anybody who did an event there on days that it's allowed could do it. It's not just for this, the group in Clemens, the VFW tonight. Commissioner Kaplan. Damon, I, I don't want to open this up to other groups. Um, 
maybe there's a way that we could say that this is allowed by a resolution from the county commissioners so that each group that wanted to do this had to come before us and ask for that specific date. It's a little more work, but <coughs> I, it, that would give us some control over who just shows up and starts shooting guns. And I agree, guns in a park are not the greatest thing on the planet, but and even if they're blanks or not, somebody's gonna hear it and get scared these days. But maybe that's a better way of handling it or another way to handle it. That, and it's, at least we'll have some knowledge of who's going out there and doing it. And Gloria's right, these people do this, all the, they do it at funerals all the time. I'm surprised they didn't say we're gonna play taps because I really like that more than the other stuff they do. But uh, maybe, maybe that would be something that would work. And, Don't and know. there are already other groups who have asked to do 21 gun salutes there for funerals and so forth. Know Mike Anderson's here. This is not an original kind of request. Um, this is the first time we've kind of had it for Vietnam Veterans Memorial Day. Yeah, and, and I think this group said three times a year. Am I uh, right the, about that? So the, those um, commemoration days would be the ones that they, that they could happen, no matter who did it. But I think if I, if I understood what Commissioner Kaplan is talking about is that nothing would be, one of the conditions for having an event like that would be a resolution from this body authorizing it. And like you said, it's more work, but then that would sort of preclude the issue of requiring somebody to inspect them. And I will defer to the attorney on that, but if we did a resolution in the end, Guilford would have to be okay, because our ordinance really doesn't apply that the open carry, we're just agreeing that if they want to allow somebody to shoot the park, then we're fine with it. But in the end, it's in Guilford County, and they have a prohibition on open carry and discharge of weapons, other than for ceremonial events and events where there's like a responsible person or whatever that was in the, the last slide there. Uh, so ultimately, it will be them that is saying, okay. And the commissioners, since we all agree on the regulations to run the park, this item would basically say we're okay with if you give somebody approval to do this. It's in Guilford County. Mr. Vice Chair, if I may, I, I, I think um, I'd, I'd be happy to, I mean, Damon and I have been working on this a little bit. I'd be happy to talk with him some more. I, I think there may be a way that we could narrow the groups who could apply for this and, and not have to come back to you, the board, every time. That would, that would take a lot of your time. Uh, right now, what it says is that it would need to be approved by the by Guilford County, which we can't get around because it's in Guilford County, and the um, the Parks Director, the Forsyth County Parks Director. So we might be able to craft some language to limit who could apply for this. Okay. Good. It's good. I, I guess the I, I know the group wants to do something this March 29th, and I, and I know we're at March the third. Um, do you think we can get all that done by March the 29th? So uh, your meeting's on the, the 17th. So if this resolution passes, then the county's part will be done. We just have to generate some signs. But after today, I would talk to Guilford County and let them know kind of where, where it appears that you are and then uh, find out what they're doing. Because I've had some conversations with them already, with their park staff and their manager's office staff, but they haven't told me one way or another about this event in particular. And perhaps they're waiting to see if the commissioners were okay with that regulation at the park. Mm -hmm. And this resolution would say you're okay with that kind of resolution at the, at the park. Seems reasonable. Yeah, I just. Okay. All right. Thank you, Damon. Thank you, Damon. All right. Uh, so you've got um, four budget finance matters that we are uh, working on for that will be presented to you next Thursday. We've got a budget ordinance amendment for Forsyth Technical Community College where we marry up. Um, dollars that are in contingency with what actually happened with um, uh, the salary funding for the community college personnel. And so we're, uh, we'll present that to you. Uh, we have a revision to the Home and Community Care Block Grant County Funding Plan, some additional funding there. You've got a budget ordinance amendment, another one from the state as dollars are coming in for the women's uh, and the nutrition services branch from DHHS. And then you've got an amendment um, where we're asking you to appropriate some fund balance 
for the FY21 Church and 4th Street Parking Deck Annual County Contribution. And what you'll hear next Thursday is that that, that was built originally as an economic development incentive. We are nearing the very end of that payment. I don't think there is a payment next year. And so Kyle will review the details of that for you. But um, we do have a payment that we've got to make in this year that's kind of the final payment. Um, you got one grant matter, which is um, we, there was apparently $50,000 that was in a state budget for a domestic violence court coordinator. We're sort of tracking that down as, after the uh, state budget got approved, and so we'll, you'll hear about that. Um, so those are, those are the grants and budget ordinance amendments. Um, you've got contracts. There are three of those. Minor is going to present to you um, the continuation for the three recycling convenience centers. That's been a real challenge um, just with bidders in the environment we're in, but he's done some great work on that, and he's trying to finalize that now to present it to you next Thursday. Uh, some nurse supplies, which is just a routine uh, purchase that we're going to ask you for, to approve uh, or consider. And then you got an interlocal agreement that I think Chantel was talking about. She will present the details of that interlocal agreement that the city um, is going to do around that program. And so that's what we've got there. You've got a whole bunch of appointments that we will be finishing. Those probably end... Applications close Wednesday at five. Wednesday at five, and so and we really do have some of those we need to fill. And I know um, Ashley's been working on some sort of extra efforts to try to get interested folks in some of those hard to fill positions. Um, and then you've got uh, three tax matters and um, and a refund. So um, I appreciate again. I appreciate y'all uh, letting us change up the schedule a little bit and let us do just more of an informal introduction on these items in this first briefing. Uh, we will have staff in uh, to review those, and it really is, a, a, I think, a very efficient um, uh, move to be able to, you know, so staff doesn't have to sit through a formal meeting before they're in here to present those briefing items and come in, make their presentations, then take on off. Mm -hmm. I did have like three other matters that I wanted to run by today real quickly. Um, so uh, the first one is COVID update. In the, um, in the meeting, I think the question was asked from Commissioner McDaniel, um, you know, what we were thinking around that, and, and, and I just want to make sure it's okay. We were thinking that it, you know, every week probably is a little too often now, but every formal meeting we'll still have the health department to come in and do that briefing on COVID. Does that sound? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Could I, I, I hope this is an appropriate place to ask this, but mm -hmm. since we're talking about COVID, mm -hmm. are we still under an emergency order? I think we are. Gordon. How long will that thing last? Until it is lifted. I don't I don't know. I mean um, what what is the pro state of this the the county um, chairman on behalf of the county uh, issued a declaration of state of emergency in March of twenty twenty. Uh, the state has done the same thing and so we are still under that until it's lifted. But, but it has no mandates for masking or anything in that. It, it does not have anything in effect as of now. It would allow you to do that. It right. would allow you to, right. if, if things suddenly turned worse, you could put in some restrictions. But as of now, there is none. So if, if w whenever the county does decide to declare the uh, state of emergency over, then you would not have that ability to quickly make a change but it's it's um it's a judgment call for, for the for the board and that makes that makes sense I, I i think the the every regular meeting two times a month basically updates i think that's good so we so so the chairman is not going to um declare our emergency order over until the governor does is that what i'm understanding no, I, I don't think, no, that's not, that's not been my understanding from the beginning. Were you going to do it now? <laughs> I hadn't even thought about it, to <laughs> tell you the truth. Well, it, can I ask this question? It seems to me that many times as the, as the governor declares emergency orders on hurricanes and things, whatever, I look at, it, it, it kind of makes the state eligible for various types of federal funds. Mm -hmm. is, there, is there a possibility that there may that this would that if we went back and forth, we preclude the preclude the possibility of any federal funds that would be related to this state of emergency, or am I 
Am I, am I mixing my emergencies to the point that it's not going to be that that doesn't make any sense? I, I think you're right, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman. I, I, I would say that if, if the board is of a mind uh, to lift the declaration, you might want to have a report from Joshua or Dr. Ole or somebody about that. But, but it, at the end of the day, it's up to you all as the board to make that decision. Are you saying that we have the authority to supersede a governor's mandate? No. That's what I but, thought. But, but you, we, you issued, Mr. Chairman, a declaration of a state of emergency for Forsyth County. Right. And so the board, either you or the board as a whole has authority over that. But you're correct. We do not have authority over the state. Okay. Well, I don't want to be really dense here, but if, yeah. if I understood Commissioner Wisenhunt's question was, is that why, you know, why don't we discontinue it? And I was only asking the question, is there a reason to leave it alone because we might be eligible to receive some other kind of federal dollars, like in the examples of disasters, natural disaster kind of issues, state of emergency, allows the opportunity to apply for FEMA funds. I think I'm saying that right. Yeah. So is there any reason that we would want to not rescind it for that reason. That's all I'm trying to get at. I, I, and I don't, you know, I, I, I used to know more about this than I do now because it seems the whole world just went crazy. But in the old days, um, you know, the local governments, a, a storm came through, you would move pretty fast to do a state of emergency because there was, first of all, there was an imminent danger, you know, had a hurricane or whatever coming in. So you would do that. And, and that would also include you when, when if you had to spend money and you made a FEMA payment for, uh, you want to try to claim something on a FEMA uh, claim later. Um, what would al always happen is there would be a statewide uh, emergency declaration that would really supersede you. And so you could you pull back yours um, and, and, and you would be eligible for the FEMA piece. In this particular instance, um, there has been, um, I'm not sure of any money that's really come through, you know, there's been lots of money thrown at COVID, but not much of it has really come through that side of it. So I don't, we, I don't to my knowledge, we've not made a FEMA claim. I think, er, I think early on we had the option of um, opting for FEMA money and, and it, was right. going, it was going to be so um, burdensome on us to get the FEMA money. And then the CARES money came along, and, and ARPA, and and so to answer your question, I'm 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 sorry, Mr. Vice Chairman, I didn't answer your question clearly before. Personally, I I don't know of any federal money we'd be missing out on if we ended our declaration of state emergency, but I I don't, I don't know I don't know of any. You know, I would think we, you know, the problem we've got, that, at least in my mind that we're discussing now, is we've got to be careful on how we word things and how we do things to keep the public we're trying to protect from becoming confused. I mean, you go to a grocery store or whatever, and everybody in there is wearing masks, but they've heard that we've lifted that state. Well, what, what happens if they say, well, what about the governor? What about the federal government? I mean, you know, it's, it's got to be something everybody can buy into and understand and carry out without having to worry about it. And I've had, <laughs> I've had some people say to me, well, when do I not wear a mask? And, yeah, and one of the things we've had, I think for the school board, for example, one March was when they lifted. Am I right or wrong? Two days, three days ago. They had a mask. They, they were not Right, but now they're messed. And you see, most of the people in this community try to keep up with what the school board's doing, what we're doing, what the government and the state is doing, what the feds are doing, and get it right. And it's kind of like walking through a minefield. But I'm open to all the solutions in my mind as to the wisdom of this board. We will include it as a discussion item next Thursday. So <laughs> we will certainly do that. Um, so the second item also came up today. It was really kind of spun out from the um, from the tennis discussion. Damon, do you just want to 
talk a little bit about, I think next week we'll be in a position to, to talk about the survey results that we got from Tanglewood and, um, and really what prompted that. So, so the, the survey that uh, asks gives three options for people to select. One is to continue doing what we're doing, but there's uh, six clay courts, four hard courts. That was option one. And then hire somebody to run the courts, which you know, we've had difficulty retaining because they've not been able to, to make it uh, you know, operate financially for them. The second option is to uh, replace the soft courts with additional hard courts, which would give us 10 hard courts, uh, tennis courts. And so if you have 10 courts, you can apparently hold a tournament that would be confined to Tanglewood even. Right now, we can't do that because you don't have 10 courts of any one surface. But uh, you know, the tennis community is uh, fond of the clay courts. Uh, however, there is an expense to the clay courts. So every year, you know, we pay uh, $15,000 a year to, to, to maintain those courts, uh, just to, to replace the surface, clean the lines, and all that. It takes a staff person or a vendor is doing that, so it takes staff as well. Then every five to seven years, it's another like $40,000 to replace, uh, do a lift of those courts. So if we replace them with hard courts, we really would reduce our maintenance. We could just open the gate and people could just use them. There'd be 10 courts with the possibility to have tournaments at Tanglewood if you know, we so desire. And then the third option was to replace the clay courts with 10 pickleball courts at least hmm. there and leave the four hard courts that are down lower behind the parking lot alone. So the survey went out uh, February 1st. It ends today around midnight. Uh, so we've got back so far uh, about uh, almost 1,500 responses to date. Um, so after tonight, we'll know what the actual um, tally ends up being. And we can present the entire issue with uh, on next Thursday around um, the, the the difficulties we had because the vendor there essentially has both walked away from the contract. So we've got a few things there, but we'll dive into that next week. I just is that make, easy to find on our website? I haven't voted yet. I haven't it's actually on the front. Uh, it's on the very front the page. Front. Of, I want to no, go vote for site. That's fifteen hundred one. Okay, and then and also you know we did this because the the current vendor. <laughs> Uh, indicated they didn't want to continue, but the board already directed staff to look at uh, doing a complex at Louisville. So when this opportunity came up, that's why we started talking about this. But, you know, if nothing happens, there's still the Louisville proposal that the board already basically funded. So we will dive into that. Uh, dive into that next Commissioner time. Kaplan has been uh, making some comments here. So, uh, just move <laughs> I know, almost there. Two more things. The Two third more things. Yeah, the, the, oh, I thought this was going to be. It, it, <laughs> geez. Could be worse, I think. So, <laughs> I always tell my wife that. Yeah, no. um, uh, the, so, the third one is vehicles. Um, so, uh, and, and I can dive into this a little bit next Thursday as well. But, um, you know, we, because of the supply chain issues, we rushed in. Um, and, uh, buying, I think, 20 or so um, uh, new law enforcement vehicles. <laughs> we just found out that um, that uh, that that order has been canceled, and really all of them have been canceled across the country. And so we are scrambling a bit with vehicles. So um, I'll need a little bit of um, uh, grace and mercy on what we bring you in terms of trying to make sure that we've got adequate vehicles to replace them. But that issue is becoming more and more difficult. Um, uh, these supply chain issues are, 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 are difficult and real, and um, every indication is that, you know, within the next three or four months, there'll be very few car use new cars on lots um, mm. just because of, uh, because of chip uh, availability and some other issues as well. So anyway, we're scrambling a bit on that. And then the last item I have is whether or not um, we, we need to sit down and talk about ARPA round two. We can do it next Thursday. We could do it, uh, you know, a week out out after that. I heard some thoughts around uh, kind of have a special session at 10 o'clock in the morning um, to talk through that. And we could, if next Thursday is um, is is not too soon, we can do it then, or we can we can Pretty. whenever y'all want to do it. Let's Commissioner go. Kaplan and I both like 10 o'clock in the morning. Okay. 10 o'clock next Thursday, and I'll tell you because I got the numbers. So um, out of the the round one total funding that y'all you, you appropriated, 
$27,405,915. So you had a pretty good day at the uh, pretty good day. Um, remaining is now $20,995,438. So we've given away $20 million, right? $27.5 million. $27.5. Wow. Hopefully you have invested $27.5 <laughs> million. Dollars, so. So, Kelly, I have a question um, relative to the meeting next week. Um, will we be updating our processes and procedures relative to how we're um, processing these applications and staff and then coming back to us what that's going to look like you know in my mind's eye we um we've got a clean slate we've got an experience of what we've done over the last nine eight months whatever and so if there are concerns questions changes this is a good we we really are in a position to start from a clean slate or we can make and this look a little bit like what we did what what I mean, I think my goals would be just from the management side to kind of know what you know is is to get is to uh, present the ideas kind of back to you that I've heard from you around the general areas that you're interested in funding. Try to narrow those down into the priorities, and then put some either percentages or dollar amount targets around those. Um, and so, I tell you what I'll do is we'll send you what we had. Um, from the winter work session that we didn't get to, um, you know, the goal would be to try to come up with a kind of a, a, a spending plan around area, area of focus, area of interest. Yeah. And, if, and then if we get that from the board, that would be what we would go out to the community and say, here's what the county commissioners are interested in doing in round two. What's mm -hmm. going to happen with those individuals that had pending applications, are they going to be notified and how will they be notified? Do they have to reapply? What does that look like? Yeah, we have closed round one. So we have notified them they were not funded in round one. And um, we have told them there, we believe there'll be a round two, but we're working through what the strategic direction is there. But round one's over. Okay, thank you. Uh, and, and, but next Thursday, I really want to talk about process. Okay. I mean, I, mean, I think the, the areas are important. And we, I mean, we sort of talked about that last week last week I think the process I mean a lot of people work really hard on this but I, I think we learned a few things right and I think we can do this differently perhaps um, that maybe helps us in a lot of ways and maybe even some guidance in the RFP um, some other kind of things I mean I thought I thought what we did yeah, I mean I, th I think uh, Commissioner Alamine said he, in the in the federal meeting the, I mean the NACO uh, meeting legislative meeting you know, I mean, I think we are like, we've done light years ahead of what a lot of people did. And I think we did a really good job. I, and I think we learned learned a little bit. And I think we can do probably a better job. And I really, I think the process discussion is important. Yeah, we were, you know, if you think about it, we were, um, we were out receiving applications on some interim guidance before we really had a lot of information around it. But had we waited, imagine imagine the community if we would have waited and started right now after we got the final guidance. So we were in that sort of tough slot that we knew what ARPA, the, the ARPA spirit was. Um, we, you know, we, we had a very open application. That's certainly one change that I think would, the community and, and everybody would appreciate is going into this one more focused. So you, so, you know, instead of just handing the ARPA guidance out, we say we're going to abide by the ARPA guidance, but but this is where we want to focus our dollars on. And um, we made one one advantage that I heard um, Kyle Haney mention is, you know, we got connected to some nonprofits and people in the community doing some things we just didn't know were there. And and so it was that was really beneficial. So it wasn't perfect, but it was you know it. it we felt like we needed to, to be out there moving it along because, I mean, it's still going to be a couple months before we get contracts signed, um, you know, and, and time's ticking on the, you know, the time's moving on. And so we got to get these things going. So um, I really appreciate, and, you know, the board willing to take a chance on this whole process. And I think it, I, th I feel like it came out pretty well. Thank you. Mr. 10 o'clock next Thursday. Okay. Whenever everybody's done, I've got a comment before we get finished up. They won't take long, Ted. You like this. <laughs> okay. uh, Monday, I attended a, 
uh, retirement out at uh, Horizons Park, Tim Hamburg, long time uh, extension agent here. And so um, the manager was there several, quite a few people there, 40 or 50. Uh, Damon was there and the county manager and uh, I don't know who all. But anyway, uh, the Horizons Park is it's a, Really got it in nice looking shape. I hadn't been been hadn't been over in a good while, and it's uh, I need to go by and survey some more. I didn't have enough time to do all I wanted to do. Well, after it was over with, got that done with. The manager, I want to tell you, he is multi talented. <laughs> he has built. Y'all probably know this, but if you go look at this, what I'm tell tell you about. You, you, then you'll understand better. He has built a, a log cabin down this, just on down the road a little ways at, uh, on Memorial School Road, just short ways from the entrance of the park. And now I don't know where he done every bit of this by itself not, but he done a whole lot. <laughs> this thing was dismantled, I believe, in Davidson County and moved over there and that is a, a nicest looking little log cabin. I believe it's one room, pretty good size. I believe you said it's probably 20 foot square or something like that. Uh, he did put a tin roof on it, but I understood why he didn't put a shingle roof on it because he thought a sh or wooden shingle roof, that is. He thought that might leak, but he's got a green roof on it. It is the nicest little cabin you ever seen. So, uh, you know, we're that way. He done a better job than uh, uh, I've worked on a log cabin before. When I was about 19 or 20 years old, uh, I moved a tobacco barn, but I didn't attempt to take it apart. I was I was young and didn't have much guidance, but I'd seen people around an area uh, move some buildings, and I thought, well, if they could do it, I could too. And I moved this old log tobacco barn. I don't know, I got a, jacked it all up, got a guy with a bulldozer to pull the thing to where I wanted it, and uh, as I was trying to get it, the thing jacked up where I could put a foundation under, the thing collapsed. <laughs> <laughs> so the manager was better, and he, he, he had the right concept. It, took, it would have took me too long if I'd have dismantled it and moved it, but it's, it's really nice. Y'all get close, go over that way, and the Risons Park is really good shape. What a man will do is get a man cave. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I got to tell you, it's a, it's a highlight of my career to have impressed Richard Linville about <laughs> anything like that. But that's what COVID stress will do for you. So, hey, so I, I, yeah. Yeah. I saw the picture. Mr. Chairman, I. I have one quick question for D Damon. Just one quick 30 second question. I got an email and a call from someone who wanted to rent the amphitheater at Triad Park. And I think she was told that they did not allow alcoholic beverages on the premises. And I was trying to confirm that that's our policy at all county parks. I'll confirm that, but I think that's the case, but I'll confirm it. Okay, because I remember going to Steeplechase at Tanglewood Park a few years ago. I was going to say, at Tanglewood, we have an alcohol <laughs> beverage control license. Like, we have one. Okay. But Triangle. all the other parks, okay. I don't believe that we do. <laughs> yeah, it was a little Steeplechase. I know some. there were some other adult beverages at the Steeplechase. I, I was a witness to it. We used to run accommodations and, and uh, catering. Right. <laughs> I'll second the motion. We're adjourned. <laughs> it would have been a lot longer if we.